Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Serum Free Expansion of NK Cells with K562 Base Feeder Systems for Clinical Application. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by GIPCO by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit their site at thermofisher.com backslash GIPCO. Now, we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credit. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain those credits. Without further ado, let me welcome our speaker, Dr. Dean Lee, Professor of Pediatrics and DeMarco Family Endowed Chair in Cell-Based Therapy at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Lee. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so it's really a privilege to talk to you all today, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks to Thermo Fisher for inviting me uh, to do this. Um, we've had a pretty good um, four or five year collaboration with Thermo Fisher around um, media, uh, and I'll, I'll spend a good part of the talk today uh, talking about that. Um, but just to go, sort of get everybody oriented, um, just a brief introduction around bone marrow transplant and how that has uh, informed what we do with cell therapy. Uh, a little bit of um, sort of past history of NK cell therapies um, uh, starting at about uh, two decades ago and uh, how that's evolved now into what we're doing with uh, cell therapy with um, expansion with K562-based feeder cells. Um, and then, you know, even all the way into what that means for us for clinical um, applications as well as commercialization uh, and how um, really this, this collaboration with Thermo Fisher has been an important part of getting to what is a best uh, possible product. So, um, so the, um, the idea of bone marrow transplant um, was originally just how can you rescue someone from high-dose chemotherapy? Uh, so the initial, um, I guess, experience with, uh, with chemotherapy and radiation in treating cancer was one drug at a time and um, trying to figure out what the highest doses were that could be tolerated. And then we went to sort of combining multiple different types of chemotherapy so that we'd avoid resistance or, or combining uh, chemotherapy and radiation. But all of those approaches work by killing cells that grow fast. And the other cells in your body that grow fast are your hair, uh, the lining of your mucous membranes, and your bone marrow, because you're constantly making new blood, new red blood cells, platelets, neutrophils, uh, lymphocytes. Those are constantly being made uh, by your bone marrow. So the limiting factor for how much you can give to kill your cancer is how much the rest of your body can tolerate. Um, and not your hair, because you know, you'd probably trade being bald for being cancer-free. That's, that's probably a, a no-brainer. Um, we have lots of other ways to feed you. If you have bad mucositis, um, we can get nutrition into you for, for quite a while um, while that heals. But without bone marrow um, and a functioning production of, of the blood, uh, cells that are necessary from your bone marrow, you really can't live very long. So, so anyway, bone marrow was just rescuing you from what would have been lethal doses of chemotherapy or radiation. However, what we found out was that it was not just the high doses of chemotherapy and radiation. It was the fact that we were transplanting an entirely new immune system. So when you get, when you get a bone marrow transplant, it's a whole lot of stem cells. You get those bone marrow stem cells, but you also get NK cells and dendritic cells and B cells and platelet precursors and T cells and NKT cells. And all of that is part of the milieu of the transplant when we give it to the recipient. Um, unfortunately, for 40 years, we've really not done much in terms of manipulating um, that product other than selecting stem cells or wiping out T cells. That's, that's been the biggest part of what we've done for, for 40 years. Um, but there's a lot of cells in that, and we don't we don't have a lot of control over it. So um, 
so anyway, trying to understand what we're giving as an immune system to a patient has really become a, a, a critical and important part of bone marrow transplantation for the last uh, 20 years, especially. And for me, as an NK cell uh, biologist and, and looking at NK cells as, um, as potential immunotherapy, um, this is one of, the few, one of the few figures out there that sort of look at NK cells as being sort of the center of the immunologic universe. And NK cells are really important in their direct response to cancer uh, by, by recognizing and killing cancer or virus-infected cells, but they also have this really important uh, role in communicating to the rest of the immune system. So they, they produce cytokines and um, cell interactions that activate and mature dendritic cells that lead to B-cell activation, class switching, and antibody production that activate and recruit to the local microenvironment, CD4 and CD8 T cells and NK T cells, and improve the interaction of dendritic cells to T cells. They lyse tumors that release antigens to dendritic cells. And so this innate response by NK cells to cancer is very largely what triggers the rest of the adaptive immune response uh, to cancer. So they're really critically important. However, NK cells have to be produced at a pretty regular basis by the bone marrow. They're also made by the bone marrow. And so just bone marrow um, infiltration by leukemia itself is enough to decrease NK cell numbers um, or bone marrow suppression that we have um, from other types of cancer that impact uh, bone marrow function. And then there, the cancer itself learns to um, produce lots of suppressive factors to NK cells. TGF-beta in the cancer microenvironment, um, IDO is an enzyme that cleaves tryptophan and creates uh, suppressive molecules in the kynurenin family, TIM3, other checkpoint inhibitors, um, hypoxia, low glucose, all these things uh, further impact NK cell function. And then you come to us with your cancer and we give you chemotherapy or radiation and we wipe out every last NK cell that's left. So there's now nothing that we have in, in this hole uh, that's, that's such a critical part of connecting the rest of the immune response to cancer. And so we've seen this now as, as being the, the therapeutic opportunity. Can we restore NK cell function after those high levels of chemotherapy or radiation? Can we improve NK cell reconstitution after transplant? Can we rapidly recover NK cells um, that are suppressed after chemotherapy and radiation um, so that they can do their job better uh, and hopefully we can improve the improve cures overall. So this um, as a concept um, really uh, took hold in the late 1990s um, and further expanded in, in the early part of this millennium with the advent of apheresis. So we could now get a donor um, to sit by the apheresis machine and collect a large number of peripheral blood cells in this in the far right yellow bag up at the top of this machine and give everything else back to him. So we don't need the red blood cells, we don't need the platelets, we don't need the plasma. We'll, we'll just run him, run his blood through a circuit, collect all the white blood cells, give everything back. And so doing that, um, you then have to take the, the blood that you have and the, the blood cells and remove the T cells because the T cells are going to um, be likely to cause GBH in this setting. Um, and what you have left is an NK cell product that you can then deliver to a patient. And lots of different uh, groups uh, across the world uh, did this. Um, and so this is just maybe a dozen or so papers uh, around 10 years ago that described this approach where they would do apheresis and CD3 depletion. Some of them did CD3 depletion and CD50 selection. Some of them tried to expand with some cytokines. Um, but all of them ended up with around one to two times 10 to the seventh per kilo of the number of cells that could be delivered to the patient. And that was it. You had, you had one shot, you could infuse those cells, and then you were done. So it really meant that, um, that it was really important to get the patient to then, the NK cells to expand in the patient in order for those numbers of NK cells to actually do their job, because they're, it's a, that's a pretty small number uh, of total NK cells. So, so that created a whole field of people trying to look at, can we grow the NK cells? Can we actually get them in the lab to expand to large numbers um, so that we have enough numbers to treat? Because this is it's like a drug, right? You have to have enough cells to actually do something to the cancer. So my experience in 
uh, NK cells actually started because I was trying to grow T cells. I was working with Lawrence Cooper at MD Anderson, and we, um, in collaboration with Carl June, had developed a wide variety of these artificial antigen presenting cells um, based on a cell called K562. Um, and their purpose was to provide antigenic stimulation to a CAR T cell along with co-stimulation and cytokine activation in a way to grow um, large numbers of, um, of T cells. However, we found out that, um, surprise to us, uh, every once in a while we would get NK cells to grow instead. And so we started manipulating the system to see if we could intentionally get NK cells to grow and ended up with a system that, that allowed us to create really large numbers of NK cells um, that were highly functional. And the thing that we um, kind of fell on was the fact that we were we had a couple of cell lines that expressed IL-21. And as you can see in the left graph here, they helped promote log phase expansion for many, many weeks on end, where when you grew the cells with IL-15, they would grow for a little bit, and then after about three or four weeks, they would just peter out. Um, and we determined that this was actually uh, from a variety of different um, effects that IL-21 had, the most important of which is probably on the far right graph, which is that the IL-21 induces longer telomeres in the NK cells so that they are just healthier and able to continue proliferation. If your telomeres get too short, the cells can't divide and they ultimately die of senescence. And that's what was happening with the IL-15, which you see here. Um, after two weeks, they actually had 10% shorter telomeres rather than 10% longer telomeres. So the other thing that happened was it changed their function. And in the middle figure, you can see where fresh NK cells, they produce interferon and TNF, as we all know. When you expanded them for too long with IL-15 and they started to become senescent, they made less interferon and less TNF. And when you expanded them with IL-21, they actually increased the amounts of cytokines that they made, interferon gamma and TNF, and they started making a lot of their own IL-2, um, which um, we still are trying to understand the mechanism of this and is uh, is really a novel feature of NK cells that are activated. Um, we have what seems like good function. They make cytokines. They have nice telomeres. So that all doesn't matter unless they can kill cancer. And sure enough, these expanded cells actually killed better than wild-type NK cells um, that were taken straight out of the blood. And they would kill almost anything we put them with. Uh, lymphoma cells, AML, neuroblastoma, neural crest tumors, osteosarcoma, uh, carcinomas, melanoma, colon, pancreatic. We've done breast. We've done brain tumors. Um, there are individual tumor cell lines, which are more or less sensitive to NK cells, but there wasn't any one type of cancer that wouldn't respond to this, um, wouldn't, wouldn't respond to these expanded NK cells. And so we, we really felt like we had something that was um, going to be amenable patients in cancer therapy. So just as a, um, hopefully this will come up, uh, this is a video of a um, uh, ATRT cell line. This is a really difficult to treat uh, cancer in children, a brain tumor, uh, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. And that's the big cell with the, the red nucleus. Um, the NK cell is the tiny little uh, black cell with a white halo, and you'll see when I play, press play, the NK cell is kind of feeling along the surface, trying to decide whether this is a good bad, or bad cell and kill it. And once it makes that decision, it's really a rapid event. Um, in other kinetic studies where they have looked at uh, the degranulation event, um, the initial release of granules to kill the target happens within 90 seconds of an NK cell encountering the tumor cell and making that decision that, that it's a bad cell. So that's what we'd like to happen inside of patients. We'd like to see these NK cells find tumor, kill the tumor, um, and, and uh, rapidly induce a response. Well, along the way, um, we found out a lot of other things about the IL-21. So IL-21 signals through STAT3, and we have now learned a whole lot about what STAT3 turns on inside of a cell in terms of gene transcription. I won't go through all of this, but in, in the bottom right, uh, or kind of bottom middle, let's, let's take that one, the range of genes that are turned on by IL-21 in naive NK cells, the expanded cells have even more genes that are IL-21 responsive, um, and those are in the far right. Um, 
uh, mostly congregated into um, mechanisms of DNA processes and repair, um, regulation of, of cell proliferation, uh, regulation of replication and glycolysis, which is what you'll see in a little bit, is really import, important to their, their function. Um, they have to have, they have to be fit metabolically. Um, and then uh, a wide variety of other uh, gene expression families that relate to, again, transcription and biosynthetic processes and um, uh, cytokine signaling. So um, one of those that I mentioned before is about uh, telomeres. And so we found out that actually STAT3 turns on the it's called telomerase. Um, and then we went and looked at some patients who have STAT3 deficiencies, a, a disease called Job syndrome, and found out that the telomeres of their NK cells were actually quite short compared to uh, normal patients. Um, the expansion process and IL-21 um, activates the cells and turns on high expression of lots of different receptors. So these receptors um, shown in this figure on the right um, are all the receptors that an NK cell uses to see its universe, to try to understand whether cells are dangerous or safe. And so these, having more of these receptors is really kind of important in terms of their surveillance. Um, they are less apoptotic. So there's, a, there's quite a number of genes that are differentially regulated between IL-15 and IL-21 that are related to cell death, in particular the gene BIM. Um, and that seems to be regulated by some microRNA. The most differentially regulated microRNA between IL-15 and IL-21 is one called MIR-124. Um, and we have really some, some very interesting data about how that MIR regulates apoptosis and cell division. I mentioned uh, metabolism. So um, the expansion of NK cells um, actually results in this huge change in their ability to uh, undergo glycolysis and their glycolytic reserve. This is in part related to, uh, in the figure on the bottom left, um, upregulation of glucose transport genes and uh, several genes related to the glucose metabolism cycle, um, uh, phosphokinases, uh, and um, other pieces of the of metabolism that allow NK cells to really be high utilizers of glucose. So how much does this actually change? Um, it's, maybe it's a little harder to see on this scale. Um, this was really a... a project that was defined to try to understand the difference between licensed cells and unca unlicensed cells. But look at the scale on resting cells. You can see their glycolytic capacity is somewhere in the 10 to 15 range, where the scale for expanded NK cells is in the 60 to 80 range. They have hugely upturned abilities um, to, to metabolize glucose and thereby use that energy uh, in their killing and migration. All right, so we have we have a way to make the cells, and now we had to figure out how to grow them and manufacture them at clinical grade and scale. And so what we ended up with was a feeder cell shown at the bottom here in this kind of orange cell that is genetically modified, as I mentioned, with IL-21 and uh, 41BB. And we ended up with a, a fairly simple process of sending our donor to the blood bank. They would donate a unit of blood just like anyone else. Um, the Buffy coat or the white cell fraction of that unit is usually thrown, usually use that for anything. Um, but we had actually determined that it was a great source of the NK cells. And then get rid of the T cells by CD3 depletion. And then once a week, add our new feeder cell to those cells and produce essentially a highly pure product of NK cells that could either be infused or we hoped <coughs> cryopreserved and infused later. And I'll get a little bit, uh, I don't remember if I included that data. Um, anyway, cryopreservation of NK cells has been a, a little bit of a controversy and a problem, but for us, we really felt like it was important to validate that approach um, because in order for cell therapy to really be broadly applied, you have to be able to freeze the cells and ship them and, and send them, save them. If you have to link your patient need to the manufacturing in the GMP facility, it really becomes cumbersome. Uh, all right, 
So um, just a few pieces. So how we're going to think about then moving this to the clinic, that there are some some really essential considerations. Um, if you think about NK cells as a drug, these all make kind of sense because these are the same kinds of, of things that you would want for developing a new drug for, uh, for cancer. So we needed to overcome some issues of donor variability. Um, you want your drug to be consistent and you don't want your responses to vary every time you choose you know, a, new, um, a new drug. Uh, you want to understand the dose. You want to be able to define potency. Uh, you want to know how long it lasts, um, you want, which is sort of the equivalent of pharmacokinetics. Um, does the, does, do the NK cells actually home um, and go to the tumor site? That's the same as pharmacodynamics uh, in drug studies. Are there mechanisms of resistance and how specific um, is the NK cell to your tumor type? So same kinds of things you would want to know in a drug. So we've We've actually tried to address all of these different issues in the area of NK cell therapy by looking at genetic screening to, to solve the problem of variability. Um, as I've just been describing, by looking at in vitro expansion so that we can solve the problem of dose. Cytokine preactivation with the IL-21 that I showed you greatly enhances potency. Um, understanding senescence and cytokine support so that cells last and have better persistence. Uh, we haven't really talked much about homing, but there's a lot of different addressins on NK cells that help determine where they go, and so we're trying to better understand which are the best NK cells to go to each different type of tumor. We're looking at the tumor microenvironment. Uh, as I mentioned, TGF-beta and the or hydrocarbon receptors, uh, hypoxia, checkpoints. And then in order to enhance specificity, NK cells are actually really nicely situated for that because they're what mediates most anti-cancer antibodies. So most antibodies need to target a particular antigen in the tumor, and then it's the NK cell that recognizes the antibody and kills the tumor. So we already have lots of examples of, of helping NK cells be really specific against cancer with antibody combinations. And then most recently, um, translating those antibodies into chimeric antigen receptors, just as they've been done for T cells, that you can do that also for CARS. All right, so we now have this expansion platform, and we have a lot of questions we need to answer in order to get this to a clinical product. What donors are we going to use? Do we need to apheresis the donors, or can we just collect the peripheral blood? Can we get rid of adequate numbers of the T cells so it doesn't cause GBH? Will the cells survive cryopreservation? Which feeder cell is best and what media is best? Because all of that has to somehow be incorporated into our clinical trial design and manufacturing process so that we get up, end up with a, a good, solid cell therapy product. All right, we answered most of those questions, and we decided to move forward with our first clinical trial, um, which was in the context of transplant. And so the way we constructed this um, this treatment plan was to take a standard transplant that we had lots of experience with um, using a haploidentical donor, um, which used fludarabine and melphalan as the conditioning regimen, uh, a stem cell infusion on day zero. We used post-transplant cyclophosphamide at day three and four. And what we decided to do is just layer right over the top of that the addition of donor NK cells. Now, one of the there are a variety of reasons for doing this. One of them is that, like I said at the very beginning, historically we have not had any control over what we delivered to a patient in terms of the immune context uh, of the immune content of the the stem cell product. We just gave whatever we collected. So here we want to control this. We want to actually give large numbers of NK cells from the donor along with those donor stem cells. The second is that we were starting to understand pretty clearly that although post-transplant cyclophosphamide that's given here on day three and four is really effective at reducing T cells that cause GBH, it also wipes out NK cells. And so we decided to give two more doses of NK cells afterwards at day seven and day 28 to further push the NK cell reconstitution uh, in these patients. So this started as a, um, as a clinical trial in 2012 at MD Anderson. We published the phase one data in 2017, and just a couple weeks ago, the phase two data was released um, in the British Journal of Hematology, and that's these results here, which is that compared to very carefully um, uh, curated case match controls for the, from the Center for uh, International Bone Marrow Transplant Research, CIBMTR, um, you can see that just changing 
the addition of NK cells reduced relapse rates from 38% to 4%, increased overall survival from 44% to 60%, 66%, so a 50% increase, uh, half again, um, from what the prior uh, survival rate was. Um, and that was even more pronounced in particular patients who were um, negative for donor-specific antibodies, went from 44% to 72%. Um, so nothing else changed. The only thing we did was was optimize good NK cell function um, in these patients. And so we're really hopeful this is going to move on to now um, a multi-institutional phase two uh, trial to really uh, verify the, um, the applicability of this approach. So we were able to do a couple of um, uh, correlative studies with these patients. One was to understand whether that um, uh, I showed you the, sh the figure that these NK cells obtain a really high uh, expression of all these um, uh, activating receptors. And sure enough, in our patients, we can still identify them even two weeks after the cells were infused. Um, down here in uh, bright red in the lower right-hand uh, corner, there's lots of the NK cells in those patients that are still this, this bright um, hyperfunctional phenotype that look very much like the cells that we infused, which is right in the middle. We were also able to show, oh, actually, I have some, I forgot I had some animation there, yes. So these two here really showing that they have some standard NK cells, but they still have these, these high bright NK cells. Um, so in other studies of haplotransplant with post-transplant cyclophosphamide, um, they've described the reconstitution of NK cells and T cells, and at every single time point, T cells dominate. Here, where we're able to give high doses of NK cells, the NK cells dominate. In fact, every single patient at every single time point had more NK cells in their peripheral blood than they had T cells. So we've now actually completely reversed the, pro the normal um, reconstitution that happens after this kind of transplant and biased it towards a transplant that favors uh, NK cells and anti-tumor uh, activity. Um, so just sort of one last piece around the feeder cell, because I don't want to, uh, this, this really is more, <laughs> more about the media and growing the cells than the feeder cell itself. Well, we, um, we ended up not being able to patent the feeder cell. And so there wasn't, at the time, a lot of interest in NK cells. Um, in fact, we had this external IP review in 2011 that looked at this and they said, no, there's really going to be no market for NK cells and we don't really think it's worth, you know, uh, filing a patent on T cells are the thing, um, so don't bother with NK cells. Well, lo and behold, five years later, um, in Nature Biotechnology has their cover story about NK cells as the next big thing, and as you know now, it's where there's just been an explosion in NK cell companies and trials and approaches, um, and there's a lot of reasons why NK cells really might be um, uh, have a have a niche in cell therapy for for cancer. So to do that. Right. The next thing, now that we've got clinical trials done and all of my work is, is in an academic uh, facility, we really do need to think about what it means to translate this um, to uh, the clinic, but also what it means to commercialize it to something that can be broadly distributed to everybody who wants and needs it. Translation, which is where I live most of my life, is how do I take stuff from my lab that is with 25 gram mice and translate that into 75 kilogram men, right? There's a 3,000 fold difference in the size between a mouse and a man, and that makes a big difference in manufacturing, right? I can no longer grow my cells in a little vial. Um, I need to think about big scale manufacturing. Translation, um, so commercialization, sorry, go back and forth. Uh, for commercialization, you're thinking about not what is what do I need to do in a GMP facility to grow cells for 20 patients of my 75 kilogram men, but is it practical to grow NK cells for 20,000 patients? Because that's how many AML patients are going to need this if it's actually going to work. How many every year? Right, we're going to have to have thousands of times more NK cells to make this broadly applicable. In the translation side, I think about scale up and process development. How do I go from the stuff I use in my lab, uh, serum and media and the feeder cells, um, and make technicians um, 
able to do that in a GMP facility and and make a GMP uh, FDA product. Um, I need to understand the identity of those, the purity, the safety, but I don't even have to think about potency, according to the FDA, until we get to a phase three trial. Where on the commercialization side, it's all about process optimization. What are the cost of goods? Is there an FDA compliant process? Do I have to worry about bovine spongiform encephalitis when I order my serum? And of course, yes, you do. Um, is it efficient? Is it you want processes that are independent of a technician, that are in closed automated systems. Now you have to think about potency and how do we measure potency of every batch and how do we package it and how do we distribute it. So the questions that you need to answer on the commercialization side are really quite different than, than what we normally do in an academic facility on the translation side. And the goals of that commercialization are to minimize your cost, time, variability, T cell contamination, and technician time, and to maximize your yield, your purity, your function, and stability. So um, the last piece I'll just mention about the feeder cell, since I said that we couldn't uh, patent it, what actually helped getting this to um, a company was the fact that we had a collaboration with a group at University of Central Florida that had um, worked on taking the feeder cells and basically exploding them with nitrogen um, into small little particles, almost like exosomes. And in this way, being able to produce a cell-free um, membrane material that had all the same um, uh, stimulation abilities and growth capabilities of NK cells um, without having the concern that this was a, a cancer-related feeder cell. So this is like one of those first steps of commercialization. From a from a um, academic uh, perspective, the FDA doesn't really care if I use K562 feeder cells. They're okay with that. I irradiate them. We, we make sure there's no feeder cells left in the product. But from a commercial perspective, you really, it, it's much, much harder to rely on that cell line as your, um, as your, your expansion product. So in order to change this part of the manufacturing, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because it's important when we get to the media part, you have to verify, you have to show equivalency to the FDA. You have to show them that if I grow these cells with the nanoparticles, they are just the same as if I grew them with the feeder cells. Otherwise, the FDA is going to say it's a different drug. So we had to show that they grow the same, that they grow, just like I showed you in one of the very first slides, that IL-15, they, they plateau and stop at about two weeks. And IL-21, they keep growing log phase growth. Same thing happens if you use the particles as if you use the feeder cells. Their cytotoxicity is the same. We had to look at their cytokine profiles. We had to do high dimension cytos for their phenotype and show that it didn't matter. It's a little bit hard to see here, but in green, above and below are the ordinary NK cells you would take from peripheral blood. And in blue, purple, and red are the NK cells that we had with we would expand either with feeder cells at one institution, feeder cells at another institution, or particles at a company. They all overlap together. We had to do RNA-seq and do sort of deep dive into what these cells look like. And again, they're, they're, they overlay each other perfectly in terms of their, um, their gene expression profiles. So it really didn't matter. We had to prove it, but it really didn't matter how you grew the cells, whether it was a feeder cell or a particle, as long as the IL-21 was present, as long as the rest of the stimulation um, pieces were, were present. Um, I mentioned that we had to do some scale up. We're still further scaling up um, to go from mouse to humans, but also to go from human academic studies to commercial studies. You know, I can grow um, everything I need for a mouse in a little T175 flask, but to grow enough for a um, clinical trial, I'd need to grow a thousand of those flasks, or a hundred hyperflasks, or 40 GREX flasks. It's just, it's just too much. Um, so we've moved to other kinds of systems, um, like the uh, Zuri, which is shown here on the far right. A big five liter bag is uh, with automated feeding and con consistent, um, uh, uh, feeding, consistent, um, pumping in of that media so you don't have to actually change media like you do manually. Um, we're using um, the, the Prodigy as part of our processing base so that we don't have to have open systems for collecting the initial material. Our particle manufacturing is now all um, uh, sort of moving along in a closed system. So all these pieces kind of have to work together. So, so seeing how the hurdles are when you go 
from the lab to the clinic or from the clinic to commercialization or when you change one little part of your manufacturing, it wasn't really simple <laughs> to find a serum-free media for feeder cell expansion. And we knew we were going to have to move in that direction because fetal cap serum is just, it's a problem. It's, it's hard to source, it's expensive, um, it's variable. Uh, there are concerns for safety. Um, and all of those are things that you would want to get rid of uh, if you're really going to move this to a more universal platform. So our first project that we interacted with Thermo Fisher um, was to compare every uh, GMP grade serum-free media we could find, um, uh, Fisher's or others, um, and see like how would they behave. And so the first question is, can you even support proliferation? And so in the top left, we compared our standard, which was RPMI and fetal calf serum, just for one week, just that initial week of expansion with some others, and really surprised to find that the AIM-5 with this serum replacement media actually outperformed. I was, I was only hoping to find that we would something that was equivalent, not something that was actually better. Um, when we did two-week expansion, um, the difference was uh, still significant and quite meaningful. It's about two to three times as many cells if you grew them with AIM-5. Um, we did uh, some further, like, maybe let's just go through these. Um, so the top left was all the different media. We picked the, the four winners. We did a full two-week expansion in the bottom uh, left. Then we narrowed it down to really do lots of different donors um, in the top right. And then ultimately, the last question for us was what, what actually made the difference? Was it the change in media from RPMI to AIM-5 or was it the change in serum to ICSR? And when we did that, actually everything looked the same. <laughs> so, so ultimately what we found out was that the benefit that the serum replacement um, caused was one that was most noticeable by biologic variability of the donors. So if you look at the top right, there are some donors that look exactly the same. The lines go pretty much straight across from, from FBS to ICSR. And then there are some that significantly increase. Well, it really depends on that donor. If that donor likes the serum you give it, then it grows really well. And the serum free media didn't matter so much if the donor didn't like the serum, then changing it to serum-free media, it helped a lot. So what it did more than just improve outcomes was to um, normalize outcomes, to make them more consistent, which was probably even more important from a commercial perspective, right? You really want to have a good, robust, consistent platform um, to grow them on. So, but that's not enough, right? We need to know now also, does it change the functional profile? Um, so we had to look at cytotoxicity, we had to look at degranulation, we had to look at cytokine production, and if anything, the serum-free media was better, um, but not worse. Um, does it change the phenotypic profile? We looked at all those different receptors again, and most of the time it was the same, um, but in a few cases it was actually better when it came to um, some of the cytokines or receptors like CD16. Um, some of the pathways of activation might be a little bit different. For some reason, there was a little bit less trail, um, but the cytotoxicity wasn't affected, so that was okay. And then we had to look at lot-to-lot -lot variation. So did we just get a good lot, and maybe there's just as much variation in the serum replacement as there was in serum, and that was actually not the case. So we compared all those same features, uh, proliferation, uh, cytotoxicity, cytokine production, degranulation um, across six different ICSR lots, and it was all quite uniform. In the last right um, was an attempt we had to try to understand a little bit better how to feed the cells. And, you know, if you let the cells sit there long enough, uh, they eventually stop growing if you don't change the media. And the question was, um, do they stop growing because of a lack of nutrients or because of a buildup of toxic byproducts? And um, we, we couldn't really answer that question. <laughs> they both are inversely proportional, and the more you use up the, your, your toxic byproducts, the more you, I'm sorry, the more you use up your nutrients, the more you release toxic byproducts. So it ended up being a little bit of a wash. But what we did end up with is at least having some guidelines 
for understanding what the limits were for good healthy cells. And we can't get below about a gram per liter of glucose before your um, your NK cells start to crash. So at least we have now some hard biochemical guidelines for understanding how cells need to grow. Well, that experience um, helped Thermo Fisher um, move along in actually making a brand new media um, just for NK cells. Uh, the first one that I was just talking about, AIM-5, was really made for T-cells, um, I don't know, 15 years ago? It was quite a while ago. Um, and the immune cell supplement was just sort of broadly defined for immune cells. But they wanted to understand if they really went from first principles and, and understood better um, the the kinds of uh, biochemicals that needed to be utilized, uh, just like I was showing you on that last slide, if we understand glucose utilization and amino acids and uh, vitamins and uh, minerals and all those other pieces that are part of your, your media, can we define something that is actually optimized for NK cells? Well, like I showed you before, right, this is not going to be an easy experiment. Um, it was going to have to have multiple comparison arms with um, pieces that were as consistent as possible between them. We had, we still have donor variability, so we're going to have to do as many donors as we could to wash out that part of the variability. And we were going to have to look at fold proliferation, cytotoxicity, cytokine production, their uh, gene expression analysis, their metabolite analysis. Anyway, um, long story short, uh, I think Thermo Fisher really hit the nail on the head. Um, and that new media, the NK Expander, worked even better than the M5 did for us and, and many times better than, than our PMI without any loss of function. Um, so we're really able to have nice, consistent, high-level expansion um, of these cells uh, that, that retain their function. Um, so anyway, this has been a great uh, collaboration uh, with Thermo, and we've been able to uh, benefit from that by uh, by adopting some of these media, um, and uh, hopefully we've been able to provide some good data back to them as well uh, and as they've um, moved their product along. So I'll end with just a couple of slides about where do we go next, um, and how do we now take this platform and move it into something that is even more applicable to, uh, to treating large number of patients or specific disease types. So the first is um, to really change how we think about donors. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that, that um, there's a lot of donor variability, and that's one of the things you want to control for. Um, but the field has actually moved along in several steps. Um, the first NK cell studies were all done with autologous NK cells because they're the safest. Obviously, if you get your own cells back, there's, they're probably not going to hurt you. But that situation um, was really fraught with problems of, of failing um, because of the cells themselves. So um, we tried to do, if initially, uh, like late 90s, early 2000s, some autologous cells um, studies were done in lymphoma and nobody ever saw any responses. Well, we thought that was probably because the NK cells themselves were a little bit dysfunctional. And so we did some experiments to see if expansion would improve the function of those cells, and it does. They completely restore their function. But the patients themselves are really um, so beat up by the chemotherapy that some patients, we just couldn't get enough cells to start from, and so we couldn't get enough cells for adequate doses. So that's the problem with the first box, is that you have failed expansions, you just can't treat everybody. The second move then is to go to family donors and identify um, allogeneic donors for each patient, which is, we usually refer to as our haploidentical donors. And in that setting, sometimes patients don't have a donor or they don't have an ideal donor. They have two or three people who could donate themselves, a mom and a dad and a brother uh, for most of our kids or uh, you know, a son or a daughter. Um, but not everybody has a donor. So then you have patients who just can't be treated. So the real question for us is, could we identify what we thought were the ideal characteristics of a donor and collect large numbers of cells from those 
individuals and create banks of cells that could be used as an off-the-shelf approach um, for what we would call like a universal donor. And we call it a universal donor similar to the, the idea of um, blood banking, where if you are uh, O, O negative, <laughs> if you're O negative, you can give blood to anybody because there's nobody who will reject your blood. Um, and the same idea here, if we can get, if we can identify the right universal donor for NK cells, that one donor could be given to anybody. So how do we do that? Um, so we, we really poured through the literature around what makes a good donor. And we settled on some things like having high CureB content, um, that those have been associated with better outcomes in most transplant studies. Uh, we want all the, the inhibitory cures to be licensed. That's what gives NK cells a more functional um, uh, phenotype. We want patients, uh, donors, to have had uh, prior CMV because that's what induces a particular protein called NKG2C and uh, makes them adaptive NK cells. And we want to make sure that, that those um, donors have adequate numbers of NK cells, that they proliferate okay, so we've been screening them. So we've been working for about a year and a half with a group called Be The Match Biotherapies, which is the um, sort of non-transplant arm of the NMDP, National Marrow Donor Program. And so NMDP, if you go to a bone marrow drive, they're the ones who swab your cheek and uh, put you in a database. And so they've got a database of hundreds of thousands of individuals who already have had a lot of the testing that we would need. And so we've been working them in about a year and a half to do all of this screening and collection and collect batches of uh, products um, from these donors and then expand them for therapy. And um, then from each individual, you can actually collect enough material to treat dozens, if not hundreds, of patients. So we've really just started on that. Uh, we've treated the first six patients now with the universal donor NK cells. Um, we have a couple of patients that we've been able to um, to follow those cells uh, by HLA haplotype differences uh, and see that the NK cells after we infuse them go to really, really high numbers, are sustained for a couple of weeks, and then drop back down again afterwards. Um, so we're really encouraged by this as an approach. This will greatly streamline um, the clinical trials process. Lots of patients can't wait for NK cells to be manufactured for them. They need the cells now. And it also has uh, significantly reduced our cost of goods um, probably by 80% uh, in terms of, of the cost per dose uh, of NK cells that we're, we're uh, delivering. So another thing that we need to try to overcome for solid tumors is um, the presence of TGF beta. And so we decided to try um, just as a, a a simple experiment in the lab, if we add TGF beta to our culture method, maybe we could suppress the cells that are sensitive and the ones that are resistant would grow out and we could generate these TGF beta resistant NK cells. Well, it turns out that TGF beta does nothing to cell proliferation. Um, it only inhibits cytokine production and a little bit of cytotoxicity, but it doesn't impact the proliferation of the cells. So it, it completely failed from that perspective of what we thought was going to happen. But what did happen is when the TGF beta was present for the whole time of our culture, then when you took them out of that environment, they suddenly now are TGF beta resistant. They make even more cytokine than they did before. And they've completely shut off this protein called SMAD3, which is an important part of TGF beta signaling. So that's why they're now TGF beta resistant. They can't signal from the cytokine. Um, but they've been sort of revved up in terms of their ability to make uh, to, for their other functional effects. And surprisingly, even when we're looking at things like long-term cytotoxicity, um, the green and the red in, let's just look at the, the bottom left-hand graph, this is kinetic killing um, over a three-day period of an AML cell line called Kasumi. And the green is the wild type at low ET ratios, and the red is the wild type at high ET ratios. The pink is the low ET ratio with TGF beta imprinting, and the blue is the high ET ratio with TGF beta imprinting. So the, the TGF beta cells are not just um, able to make more cytokine. They're not just able to overcome TGF beta, but they actually kill long-term even better. So we're working on that um, to get it to the clinic in a dog model. The last 
next thing I'll show you is, is we've adapted this approach to growing cells from, um, from blood bank dogs. Um, OSU across the street has a, a, a doggy blood bank where they collect blood all the time for their, their canine patients. And we're doing the same thing as we would for humans. Take their buffy coat, get rid of the T cells, expand them uh, on our feeder cell, cryopreserve them. And so we now have uh, about a half a dozen dogs um, with cancer that we've treated with this uh, universal donor approach of TGF beta resistant cells. So more to come, uh, more for us to kind of optimize. And we now have a nice, um, wonderful model to use for how to better deliver these cells. So with that, I'll just say thank you to an awful lot of people that I work with um, who help in the lab, um, former lab members who have developed a lot of this, um, collaborators that we've had all across the world. Uh, Lucia Sila is a collaborator in Brazil. She's established a whole program down there of delivering NK cells uh, that we've published together with uh, University of Montreal, where we've uh, worked with um, some gene modification. Um, lots of foundations that have really supported our work and the people in the GMP facility and regulatory IP and operations that have helped us actually get our clinical trials going. And with that, um, this is our team. Actually, this is a couple of years ago. We have a lot of new members and some of these have moved on, but um, a large team that all is necessary to make this happen. And I will move on to some questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for your time today. And we are, will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look. We already have some great questions coming in, Dr. Lee. Our first question, in your opinion, can AIM V medium plus ICSR supplement be used in expanding pluripotent stem cell derived NK cells in feeder free system? I think it's likely. Um, so we we've actually used the feeder the feeder cell system um, to expand NK cells that come from uh, IPSCs, uh, and that approach is actually what. Um, what FADE is using now in their production. So they use a feeder cell approach. And once you get to the NK cell stage, the expansion part seems to be the same, whether the NK cells come from iPSCs or cord blood or hematopoietic stem cells like, um, uh, yeah, I'm blanking on the company, but uh, uh, Encord, um, or from peripheral blood. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The the proliferation part is the same. So I would expect that the serum-free media would work the same for theirs. The key, is, I think, for them or other companies that are IPSC related um, is the pre-NK cell piece. What are you growing the iPSCs in and what, what are you doing your differentiation of iPSCs into NK cells? From the NK cells on, they all seem to behave the same. Thank you so much. And it looks like we have one more question. Can you comment on the potential of iPSC-sourced NK cells as compared to universal donor NK cells? Sure. Um, so uh, trying to eliminate as much bias as I have, <laughs> um, the real differences are in maturation and uniformity. Um, I think most of the iPSC-based companies would would hang their hat on the fact that when you start from a single IPSC, every batch you make is going to be uniform. And as I showed you in in our uh, in the slides, that is a problem for NK cell therapy is finding when you're looking for donors um, is the lack of uniformity, that there, there's a lot of genetic variability, there's a lot of um, experiential, like every time you experience different viruses, you skew your NK cells a different way. And so you have more variability. What you gain in peripheral blood um, it, or the universal donor cells being from mature peripheral blood is the licensing and education of cells. So one of the things is that NKG2C that I mentioned, um, we almost never see that on an NK cell until it's been exposed to CMV. And it's not entirely clear yet how to get an iPSC to do that um, in vitro. 
because it's never been in a person who can experience CMV. So there are some real differences. Um, and I think we're just gonna, going to take time and some comparisons to really see w if those differences matter from a therapeutic perspective. Thank you so much. And I want to thank our audience for these great questions. In your opinion, will genetic engineering such as CAR and K be required to improve potency of NK therapy? I don't think it's required. I think it is an approach that finally is gaining some traction that can improve um, specificity and can help target NK cells to some tumor types that might be less um, sensitive to the natural recognition that NK cells have. So I think what we need to differentiate um, from the rest of the T cell field is that if I take T cells from a donor, it's highly unlikely that that any or certainly no more than a few hundredths of a percent of those cells will ever naturally be able to recognize the cancer. Um, but so you have to give them a car. You have to put a car in to direct them to the cancer. NK cells already recognize cancer. That's what they're known for is their ability to recognize these danger signs that um, enable them with rapid recognition of, of abnormal cells. And so they don't have to have anything to target them. The, the car might help target them in some cases, but you're starting from a different product. And so I think there's, there's some real importance in differentiating T cells from NK cells. Thank you so much. We have time for two more questions. Can you talk more about the potential of using NK cells for solid tumor therapy? Why they may show more promise than T cells, for example? Well, one of those is what I just mentioned, that um, T cells don't naturally recognize solid tumors um, unless you engineer them with something to direct them to a surface protein. And when you do that, one of the limitations of CAR T cell therapies is that you have to find an antigen that is uniformly um, uh, expressed on the tumor and isn't expressed elsewhere in the body so that you can target the tumor and not have toxicities in other tissue. And that's been really hard to find for solid tumors. Um, we got kind of lucky actually with leukemias that we chose an antibody um, to CD19 and, uh, and that the CD19 antigen is essentially dispensable. You, you can live without it. See, if you target every cell in your body with CD19, you can still live. That's not true for most solid tumor antigens, where if you target uh, an antigen that's on lung cancer, you may end up targeting the rest of the lung or, uh, or other tissues in the body. So that's been a little bit harder. So NK cells, in contrast, <clears throat> as we showed above, um, that first slide where I put NK cells with all those different types of tumors and they killed leukemias and sarcomas and carcinomas and brain tumors, um, that's without any targeting. That is just the natural ability of NK cells to recognize those cancer cells. So I think there may be broader applicability of, of NK cells to many different kinds of solid tumors, even if they don't have the high specificity that a CAR T cell would have. Thank you so much. Now, how do we further improve the persistence of transplanted NK cells in patients? Good question, and um, there's an answer to the question, and there's a question to the question. <laughs> so persistence has been linked to uh, CAR T cell efficacy and some of the early NK cell um, efficacy studies. Only when you're thinking about um, a single infusion. So in the CAR T cell space, you have a limited number of T cells that you can harvest from a patient. They have active leukemia at the time. You, you gene modify that into your product, and most of the time you deliver the entire product to the patient. So you've got one chance to make it work. And those cells have to attack the cancer and live for three to six months for there to be long-term disease control. The early studies that I showed you with NK cells where they were derived from apheresis, you had one shot. You had one chance to infuse NK cells and they were going to expand in vivo and had to persist at least two to three weeks in order to have uh, evidence of a response. 
But now that we can grow and engineer large numbers of universal donor NK cells that are off the shelf, we can repeatedly infuse cells. Uh, in most of my clinical trials, we've infused at least three up to six, and in one case, up to 27 doses of NK cells. So we don't need to really work hard to engineer them to persist. We need to think of them more like drugs that we dose at intervals and we understand their pharmacokinetics so that we know how often to dose them and what context to dose them in. That's, that's kind of my opinion. So I think there may be some things we can do to improve their persistence, but I don't know that that is really the answer. Um, it's really, the answer is really in shifting our thinking away from what we learned about T cells. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for your time today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks before we go? Um, no, I'm just uh, just happy to have been invited. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I shifted my uh, emphasis from T cells to NK cells uh, a while ago. Um, and finally, you know, happy that uh, NK cells are getting some some uh, deserved attention. So, thanks for inviting me. And Dr. Lee, thank you again for your time today and for your important research. And I do want to take the time to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, GIPCO by Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today, and those submitted on will be on demand, period, will be directed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye.